Hey guys, Volet C here, hope that you're doing well. We're gonna take a look at a game of Conquest Last Argument of Kings between the 100 Kingdoms and my opponent Matt, who will be playing the Old Dominion. The classic matchup, played it many times. You guys have seen our miniatures on the table on this channel many, many times. It's gonna be on the scenario of Forlorn Hope and of course our first game of the new patch, which came out very recently. You might have uh, watched the bat rip I put uh, most recently on my channel against uh, Dwegum. That was a, against a newer player. I'll be playing the exact same list uh, for this one because it was at the same Auckland game stay, you know, uh, Saturday morning and afternoon games. I will say for a bit of context that when the previous patch came out and Old Dominion just went right through the roof and were just dominating, I was very salty about that because I felt like how could they you know, possibly make them that powerful and just do nothing about it for like six months. Um, I thought that was very stupid. And um, whenever I'd play against um, my buddy here, I would often lose and just wouldn't really see much that I could improve to to win. And I felt like the power imbalance was, was real. And um, honestly, you know, I was quite quite salty about that. And with the new patch out, um, they have fixed a number of things. I thought they took way too long to do it, but bless their hearts. Thank goodness they have done that. And that's more you can say uh, than you can say of a lot of other war games out there. So that's much appreciated. So where does 100 Kingdoms versus Old Dominion sit now? It's a tough one. Um, I think um, Old Dominion are, ex are still extremely strong because their spell casting hasn't really been weakened. It's just that the carries have been fixed, right? So carries are no longer capable of just deleting, um, you know, an entire regiment later on in the game. But to compensate for that, they are actually a lot, you know, faster in terms of the threat range. You can double march and shoot the the spell, so they are still very dangerous. And Archimandrites and uh, Hero Deacons could still do the same thing. They've brought in uh, Moroi now, which we'll talk about. A a little bit later in this video. Um, so I think Old Dominion is still extremely powerful. Legionnaires are just as good as they were before. So I don't really think of them as like an easy beat. Um, and, and honestly, I think that Old Dominion are probably more powerful than 100 Kingdoms, um, if I had to guess. Having said that, 100k uh, have the Hunter Cadre buff, which is very helpful, especially in this particular matchup where you kind of want that AP1 shooting to be ripping into the Legion and you want something which has their massive you know, scoring potential in turn two to stay up to speed with them in terms of scoring. So it's an interesting one. Why don't we um, have a quick uh, look at the scenario and then we'll go into some army lists. So Forlorn Hope, as you guys may know, uh, looks like this. So uh, let me just grab my thing here. You've got four zones with uh, one of them, sorry, um, uh, two of them on your side and two of them on your opponent's side. So we'll just, like, the first photo shows you this right off the bat here. So this is just fast forward to turn one where, um, you know, you're both sort of, these are all light units, but you're going to be bringing mediums on here. And the idea is just to, to win one of the two flanks. Uh, and then push through to your opponent's uh, opposite circle before they do the same to you on the other side, right? Uh, there is two VPs for enemy characters, but nothing else in terms of killing enemy units. And the uh, objectives here are worth three each. So that's these things here, right? So those uh, can be killed at any time. My opponent going for his one with the Acolytes, me going for mine with the uh, the Crossbowmen. And, and that's generally the way uh, the scenario is going to go. So not a particularly complicated one, but if we just take a quick look at these army lists. So I am running the exact same list that you would have seen on my channel most recently against Dwegum, uh, just having a bit of a play around with the big unit of um, Crimson Town now that it's a bit more efficient to get Oliphant's Raw, and of course you can get Blessed on these two regiments here. Nothing needed for the Ashen Dawn, they just are what they are, they're still very good. Imperial Officer unlocking the Hunter Cadre with the new Steel Legion mainstays. These are fine, um, possibly better to just take shooting or minute arms, but still, it's not too expensive to get the Steel Legion, and they do crack armor pretty well, and the Officer supports them quite well once you put in the Brace for Impact on your feet. That's all very good. Uh, so quite a cheap way of, of getting them with just a 90-point character. Hunter Cadre, great. Obviously, given the standard bear, it's only five points. They're great in close combat, but uh, even better at shooting long range. They have range 18 now that the uh, mercenary crossbowmen don't, so they're probably the premium um, range shooters, especially with longbowmen still not getting the buff that they kind of need. They've got a bad warband, and uh, this is the longbows I'm talking about, and uh, just don't do damage quickly enough. 
Then lastly, the Mage, she's still very solid with a School of Fire and Focused, very good unit. Guess for well, optional, I kind of like it uh, because the game plan here is just to let them come to you and pick away at them and counter charge once they get close. So I'm, I, I like the extra punch that the Mage is packing there. And the moral of the story with the new patch is that you want more regiments. It's more about order activation, even more so than it was before. So that's why I'm trying to get as many of these little regiments in here. The next list I'll be trying out will be a Noble Lord instead of Priority Commander. And I'll try and get up to about 13 cards, to be honest, because um, having the extra activations is that important. And I'm even going to be trying out this thing, Art of War. But more about that in our next bat rep with Under Kingdoms. For now, let's talk about the undead. So uh, Homeboy is playing Archimandrite Warlord. It is uh, probably still considered the weakest Warlord, but it's just, it starts to feel ever so more, so, uh, it just feels more and more appealing because because you're going to want the carries and Moroi because they're very good now. Um, having the Blasphemous Power going on to them early game is quite uh, critical. And then you can still do the healing as the higher Deacon lifts your uh, Legionnaires with the Dark Shepherd, heal them back. And late game, you've got a lot of un unholy baptism going on. So um, there's nothing really wrong with the Archimand Mandrite, except for the fact that the other characters are also damn good. So overall, Old Dominion still have the best character lineup. It's just a little bit questionable that they can compete with some of the other nutty stuff that factions can do um, in terms of the combos, right? So you're putting the Archimandrite in the Pra Praetorian Guard, as you should. I, th I love that combo. It keeps him safe, allows him to get close to use his abilities. I think that's the best thing you can do with the Archimandrite. He's taking the new Legio e Primigenia, and that is totally changed. It used to be the Aura of Death uh, godlike um, banner, but now it just permanently makes you count as one higher for dark, uh, dark Power, which is great for Praetorian Guard because they are one of the things in Old Dominion that makes use of Memories of Old the most. So you want to get, you're starting at tier two, you always get Bastion as a draw of in, and then you quickly get to tier uh, three effectively with the Archimandrite's uh, banner. And that way you can get their defense up to defense five to keep the Archimandrite alive and he's healing the back. It's just a great combo, very solid. And I expect we'll see this a lot. Hyra Deacon with the cultists, that's pretty cool. Gets them on the table early, allows you to cast Dark Supplication. Uh, love it. Centaur Kerikers, they might be a little bit too expensive for their points, but I think more place testing is needed, especially in the new patch. Um, their Memories of Old just doesn't really give them very much, and that's sort of a drawback. I feel like if they could get something in addition to Sure Shot at... Um, at the extra um, dark power level, that'd be great. Like I wouldn't mind seeing them go up to 200 points, but the Memories of Old gives them sure shot and plus one volley. Because then um, at tier two, your draw of ending up to volley three. And um, I guess I suppose at, at tier three, you know, you're gonna be aiming rather than double downing on it. So you might not even need the points increase in that case. It's probably fine to give them something like that. Bucephaloi, uh, still not the best, but you know, the models are cool at least. They kind of need a little bit more. They got Tenacious, I believe, but they didn't get Hardened. So they're still very beatable, but uh, I love the incremental buffs that that they uh, are giving to certain units. Xiliarch, I think he's really um, best used as a Warlord. Um, but uh, unlocks the Prodromoy, that's great. Uh, Ranging Guard, they're always uh, pretty good. Uh, but overall, this is probably not the most meta list that I, I would run. If I was running Old Dominion, I would personally take something similar to the Archimandrite Zedek setup here, and I, I would take the Higher Deacon, but the third warband would most likely be the Stratagos, uh, possibly even the Mounted Stratagos. The Fallen Divinity is also looking very, very good. Okay, so let's just jump into this game. We've fast forwarded here, just go straight through to the end of turn one, because it's just set up at this point. And uh, we'll talk you through it. So we've got two carries over here. That is because the Archimand uh, sorry, the Hyre Deacon has used Dark Shepherd on him, and then we're expecting the um, Archimandrite to come in through here and heal these carries back. You've got the uh, Cultists, which are going after this objective, and the Moroi, which are going straight into the woods. They actually have an anti-shooting ability naturally, but he's double downing on that, seeing that the fearsome double unit of crossbows are right through here with the, the mage included and I'll be, of course, taking on this uh, smaller objective here, right? So let's get on with it. Uh, turn three, we're bringing on the Hunter Cadre. We're bringing them on last. I want to see where his deployments are before I triple march them onto the table. They do have Vanguard with the Imperial Officer in this list. So that's a full, I want to say, 19-inch move, medium scoring, very, very powerful. 
As predicted, uh, Archimandrite comes on the board, Praetorian Guard uh, Escort. You can see he's on the right-hand side of this unit facing towards my line because he wants to keep the range close enough onto the carries to heal them, but also close enough to the, to the Moro on the left to, to give them Blasphemous Power. For me, seeing where the Moro are, I'm bringing over the men at arms onto this left hand side just to creep onto this objective uh, opposite the carries. I feel like he might have misdeployed the carries a little bit because that house is in the way. The carries are just so dangerous against this Hundred Kingdom style because they're going up against Resolve 2 units. They can get a lot of damage done. So over here, carries, um, they are believe, I believe being healed, or maybe this is the shot from the cultist onto the objective. Wasn't quite sure. Mage just pulling back a bit because we do have these. Moroi in the distance and this is the point in the game where I think I will talk about Moroi a bit more. You can see uh, quite clearly that's the Moroi unit in the forest and there's a long distance between them and the mage and both regiments would love to attack each other but when my opponent explained to me and I look I should have already known this but when my opponent explained to me that Moroi have a, a free translocate now of eight inches and that you can potentially translocate first and then charge and then clash, giving them effectively 14 inches move plus D6, which means that it's 15 inch guaranteed or up to 20 if you want to risk the roll. That's a long threat range and it, it made me temporarily feel a bit salty and a bit angry that uh, that kind of thing would be allowed in the game. It's like you hear about Parabellum talking about how they, you know, they don't want people to activate more than three times and they want to restrict that and they're not letting you do this and that with Wadroon with too many sort of rushing across the board and killing you. And yeah, they're going back to like Moroi and giving them the ability. It's almost like you take away from this faction, you give it to this one and the game still has this, this thing where you've got okay there's a unit that clearly outranges me and I'm never going to out threat it and I'm just inevitably going to get charged by this regiment and nothing I can do and that, that to me that sort of feels a little bit bad like I, I would have preferred some other way of buffing Moroi other than that the other thing they can do is they can um, uh, double march and translocate which gives them effectively 12 20 inch guaranteed into contact with your regiment and then you don't suffer a lot of aura of death but there is still some aura of death so it's like inevitable damage that you can't really play around so the reason why i don't think uh, moroi and old dominion are completely busted and like far too powerful especially relative to what they were before is that um, the Moroi can be traded with. Like if they come over and jam you up and they don't win the roll, you can shoot at them and charge them and, and they'll disappear. But even then, your opponent's getting the dark power in the early game and you've got to win the roll. Otherwise, you know, they go first and they clash you. It's just a bit awkward for armies that rely on some early game light regiments like, like I am here with my particular build. So I didn't love that. Um, it's it, it, it's not a problem. Like I can still you know compete against this list, and it's not it's not the end of the world. It's just I felt a little bit um, annoyed that you know they they had to have such a massive threat range, and there was really no um, no downside. Like you could do it at uh, t a dark power tier one or whatever. It's still still possible. All right, so um, Cultus continuing to bash up this objective very slowly. My guy's doing the same thing on our side of the table uh, over here. On his um, on his other flank, he's got the Legionaries with Optio moving onto the board, 17-inch run range, uh, straight onto the objective to score. That's what they do best. And opposite them, I'm bringing in my Hunter Cadre uh, to shoot them. This is a, a triple march, by the way, so I can't shoot this turn, but of course the Legionaries can't charge me turn two, so I'm just going to get the jump on them and, and shoot them first. The uh, carries over here still haven't been healed back by the Archimandra, but that's about to happen next. And uh, through the center here, I've got my other unit of Hunter Cadre triple marching onto the, the zone on the right-hand side. And I have to explain that the reason why things have developed this way is that my opponent activated his Moroi a little bit too early. This is not a problem with Moroi. This is just a decision here from my opponent to have his Moroi card fairly early into his card stack, command stack in turn three, meaning that I didn't have to perpetually worry about being zoned out. I was able to triple march these guys up onto the zone to collect the points, which is important, knowing that if he wins the roll, he can just trade his Moroi for my uh, Hunter Cadre, which I was actually okay with, all things considered. Because you look at this, 
Moroy, 180 points. Hunter Cadre, 165, including the standard bearer. So it's not the end of the world if your opponent throws away an expensive unit like that. I'm okay to do the trade. I've got a lot of other range units here, which can shoot directly into the Moroy. And if he attacks them outright, at least I've got evasion too. I've got reasonable morale, uh, and I might not completely use the, lose the unit. So that happened. And my opponent activated the Moroy early. I was able to bring these guys on. It allows me to at least win the roll next turn. And then I thought better of it. I picked them up and moved them all the way behind this forest because I realized, actually, um, I don't really like that because the Praetorians could double march and they can nuke me. And the Moroi, they don't actually have to charge me right there. They can um, they can charge me then, um, wipe me out, win the roll. Um, what can actually also happen from that position is that the Moroi uh, can actually translocate charge clash th um, <laughs> this particular turn. Um so I'm, I'm getting I'm getting my my storytelling a little bit a bit muddled up here. So I, I I took that photo when I'd sort of had that thought process, and then I brought them over here, and I don't think the Moroi had actually activated at that point. Um, well, maybe they had. I see a little bit of a card up there. I can't quite remember, but the main thinking the main thing that I'm trying to communicate here, guys, and I'm sorry about the waffle, is that I was intimidated by that unit, so I stayed behind the hill and didn't actually take the zone this particular turn. So we end up with this position at the end of the turn where uh, neither of us have actually taken that area. So this has got a light unit on it because these guys are light and I haven't taken this one. Whereas over the side, we've both put a medium unit on the zones. And the thinking here is that if the Moroi go all the way over here with a double march translocate, I've got a shooting unit here and a shooting unit here to box them in and kill them. So that will hopefully leave the Moroi there for a while. But the problem is they're in the forest. I can't, I can't shoot them very, very easily or very efficiently and they can attack at any moment, all right? So we come into turn th three, I want to say, yeah, turn three. So I'm picking Hunter Cadre first, and the reason for that is that if his Moroi activate, I can I can actually counterattack them very, like, very swiftly. But if he leaves his Moroi there just waiting for me to, to act, I can activate the other Hunter Cadre card on the other side of the table and just shoot the Legionnaires. And then you've got the Crimson Tower coming in last. They are the most powerful unit in the army, so I just want to put them somewhere that they are really going to have good impact on, on, the, on the battlefield state. So I did win the roll. The guys on the left activate, and they shoot at the Legionnaires, inflicting a few wounds. Then my opponent brings in the Prey Praetorians onto the zone, happy there, casting some spells with the Archimandrite. Legionnaires moving in through as well, uh, just to support them a little bit in the rear. Uh, also very important because they can actually score later if he wants to move his Praetorians onto my side of the table, so that's that's what that's for. We have the uh, the little swordsman here, the men-at-arms, actually charging the objective, even though they, they could only fit one stand touching it. I've got relentless drills, so that's another eight, eight support attacks effectively, or four supporting attacks on top of the, the base four there, so that does finish the objective off and clears the way. Uh, that is when the crossbows activate after this and also shoot it. Right, so we have a picture of the Mori here. What are they doing? I think that he decided to just pull back, seeing my little trap in place. And uh, I think that's a smart move because I hadn't activated the crossbows in the mage at that point. So that if he does translocate and double march over there, then I still have everything else to just um, you know attack that unit with and it wouldn't have been worth it. So he decided to just pull back. So the mage um, also just staying cagey here and just not moving very far into range. In fact, pulling back a little bit so that I can fit my Steel Legion to march over top of them. On the right hand side we have the carries coming back with two wounds, that's because they had Dark Shepherd pull a standoff, our Commanderite has put them back on there, two wounds left, and the Legionnaires as you can see have sustained three wounds from the distant Hunter Cadre shooting at them. Speaking of Hunter Cadre, he has now moved his Moroi, he's activated them, they haven't left the forest, so the Hunter Cadre just move up a little bit and shoot long range. They don't get much damage done because the forest penalty there, um, but this does sort of put them in a position where the, the Moroi could go after them, but because I'm bringing in the Crimson Tower this turn, I can sit up in a position where the Crimson Tower can countercharge the Moroi, or if the Moroi go after the Crimson Tower, well, I'm defense four, I'm, I've got decent resolve, I don't care about them that much, and the shooting units can just obliterate the Moroi at that point. So everything playing around this one regiment. 
As you can see, I've left myself a bit of room for the Imperial Officers Regiment to double march. Loving the, this photo. Sometimes they come out nice and sharp and the paint job looks good. But this is a whole contingent of Steel Legion on the objective now to start the scoring effort. The downside of this play, of course, is that the Mage and the Crossbowmen are trapped behind and actually just can't shoot past them at all, which is a massive waste and could be hugely detrimental. But you've got to bear in mind that he hasn't deployed either of his Centaurs or his... Um, his uh, undead minotaurs, what are they called? Bucephaloi. All right, so if he brings in any of those regiments on this side of the table, I can at least shoot over the Steel Legion. Otherwise, I'm just going to have to move one of these units out of the way. So he does bring in his centaurs on the other side, realizing that, and they are just going to be on the opposite end of the table. There they are there, looking very good. My opponent uh, working very hard on the paint job, I must say. So seeing that, I decide to counter them with my uh, Ashen Dawn. Of course, the Ashen Dawn really don't care about uh, Centaur Prodromoi. They will eat them for breakfast, even in their nerf state at five attacks each. And they're also going to be looking at that forest as well, just because Ashen Dawn don't really care that much about forests. It's just a nice little bit of cover and uh, blocks some impact hits. And they're just going to um, slowly clean up this flank and hopefully attract a lot of enemy deployments to this side so that it'll be easier for me to win on the other flank. So my opponent does bring in the second unit of uh, centaurs. This time it's the Kerikes, and they, of course, have their little bow guns, which can shoot over the legionnaires quite effectively once anything comes within their, their range. So um, as planned, here come the Crimson Tower Knights. I decided not to go uh, opposite the centaurs because um, the Ashen Dawn kind of already have that locked down. And on this side, this is a regiment that can do some damage to the Praetorians, provided that I get in there before he uses Bastion. Or if I get in from the flank, that will also work. Um, I've just got to deal with those Moroi, and uh, these knights will be able to do that. Even if there's a forest, I'm hoping that he leaves the forest. Otherwise, we'll just have to slowly advance and shoot in the long term. But feels very good to be using this regiment. So there we have it. This is the end of turn three. A really good battle line set up here. Really, the only unit that I have left to bring on is my other unit of Steel Legion, whereas he is uh, not rolling that well for his reinforcements. You can sort of see next to his hands here on the table, we've got Vranger Guards and Bucephaloi left to deploy. So turn four, I'll be starting with both regiments of Hunter Cadre and working my way all the way around to the Crimson Tower. The plan at the end of the card stack is to put the Crimson Tower either countercharging the Moroi or something that's on my side of the table, or if he hasn't committed anything, I will move into a position where I can march charge the Praetorians in turn five. That is the goal here. All right, so another zoomed out view of the battlefield and we're going for the dice roll. Who is going to win it? Well, my opponent does. So he gets the Archimandrite there, healing back carries uh, and putting down, um, you know, Blasphemous Power or whatever he, what he needs to do, possibly on the Moroi and uh, activating the um, Praetorians if he needs to. Then on my side, we have the Hunter Cadre shooting at the Moroi, expecting them to try and attack at this point. We almost did enough damage to remove a stand, but not quite, so they are fully operational. And then my opponent makes this play where he translocates and he march charges into the... Uh, sorry, he translocates and charge clashes into the Steel Legion, which is sort of like the play we were waiting for. And, and, and this is a good uh, way to illustrate why Moroi aren't completely busted and uh, my, my being salty about them was really just hearing about their ability for the first time. I think they're still very, very good. You have to find the right opportunity to play them well. But in this situation... They're going up a, against a unit which just has your basic defense three but has oblivious and reasonable um, resolve. And this is a regiment that I can afford to lose and I can easily, uh, efficiently counterattack onto the Moray without committing anything else. So tragically, my opponent rolls disastrously here and just gets hardly any damage done at all. But after that dice roll, we talked about it a bit and I pointed out that even if the dice were perfectly average with him making something like 18, 19 attacks and hitting half of them and then me blocking, you know, um, 
a third of them and then taking some resolve checks and only, you know, only suffering half the resolves thanks to Oblivious. I'm going to lose one or two, st- like one, one and a half stands tops, and I'm going to be able to counterattack them anyway. So I just feel like this play was a bit jittery. Like either you commit them really early against the crossbows or you hold them back for as long as you possibly can and just have them fight in tandem with something else that's on the board. Like if you if you just pocket them, all the way up until when the Varangian Guards and the Bucephaloi are there and you slowly advance through, and by then everybody's at Tier 3, that's the way to beat 100 Kingdoms. It's not really so much a fault of the, the matchup here. Beautiful little photo, though. Um, Moroi looking very vicious. Um, lovely paint scheme. On the other side, uh, more Hunter Cadre shots into the Legionnaires, just continuing to do damage, I believe. We're eventually taking them down to two stands. So that's them there, just poking forward. Not much they can do. They're in a bad spot. They need to create room for the uh, Centaur Prodromor in the background. I'll just take this uh, away there. So you can sort of see them up the back there. Yep. All right. Uh, We have the Praetorians just gathering their uh, ability there. The Archimandrite is towing his uh, little tiptoe onto the hill, which will give him more vision for anything coming nearby uh, that might get nuked. Over here, lovely photograph. I love it when things come into contrast there. The Steel Legion haven't actually lost any stands because, again, their role was so pathetic from the Moroi. So the big swords swinging back, inspire clash, and absolutely obliterating the Moroi. Okay, further in here, we've cleared the objective out of the way. The crossbows can move up and shoot at the Archimandrite. Not doing very much at all because it is defense five after all. But, hey, I mean... I'd take it over, you know, the Eternal Discipline plus Aventine Armor that we saw every single game uh, for like six months in the last patch. On this side, we're measuring how far away the men-at-arms are, and I'm just trying to get into a position where um, I can avoid the carriers double-marching and, and shooting at my, uh, well, not shooting, but uh, using their free spell onto my men-at-arms. So I'm just trying to play that a bit cagey. Over the other side, uh, the Centaurs continuing to advance around, just trying to figure out how far away or how close to the Ashen Dawn they really want to be. So the Ashen Dawn decide to double march through here. I'm just trying to protect my shooting stuff from um, like a, a, a march charge from the Legionnaires. I don't want them using their Memories of Old ability into my zone because that could result in him actually stopping me from scoring for a turn, which would be a disaster. So over here, the Kerries just skirting around the forest, sorry, around the building a little bit, but not able to achieve that much here because of the terrain. We then have the uh, Kerry Kerries going after the Ashen Dawn with their pew pew shooty bows with um, a little bit of armor piercing, but not really rolling very well there. My dice rolls were quite good. The Ashen Dawn taking zero, zero wounds. We then have the final reinforcement of the game, which is another unit of Steel Legion Extreme. Left-hand flank for these guys, just trying to sneak around that left-hand side. And sorry, when I said final reinforcement of the game, I meant for my army. He still has his Bucephaloi and his Varangian Guard. So these guys are just moving around to sort of bully the Centaurs and just really trying to bait my opponent into bringing more onto the side of the table, like Bucephaloi and Varangian Guards. If he put both of those regiments on this side, it's... It's pretty clear that I'll be able to beat him on the other flank and start scoring more quickly than he can actually box my units in over here because his stuff would be too slow. And he does indeed bring the Bucephaloi in here. I feel like this is a little bit of a mistake. It's a bit of a traffic jam. And I think the reason why he wants to put them there is because they are they are very good against Ashen Dawn. They have that cleave. They are quite resilient. So in the long term, you should be able to chop the Ashen Dawn down. But that they're also very good against Crimson Tower Knights. So I don't know if I if I personally would have deployed them here. But you also have to protect your objective as well from the Ashen Dawn and just marching all the way through. The mage uh, trying to move sideways, completely blocked off by my troops in front as we predicted, but that's okay. I'm 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 all right with staying at a long range away from the uh, Old Dominion at this point. We then have, as as planned, the Crimson Tower Knights are marching just a little bit further forward, and the thinking here is to keep them just under 15 inches away from the Praetorians, because... 
if I do that, it means that I have the opportunity to charge them if I win the roll. If I lose the roll and he puts up defense five, bastion stuff, I can just go after the legionnaires or something else. I can keep planning my turn. So I, I really lose nothing by doing this, but if I succeed, then I go straight in the front before he has Bastion, and that will uh, threaten his Warlord. And I can't really afford to let the Archimandrite stay alive for the entire game. It becomes more powerful as time goes on, and those double spells um, really are quite painful. So this is the thinking here. So when we go to turn five, Crimson Tower Knights are the first card. Perfectly fine. If he does activate the Bastion, doubles up, then these guys can just, you know, move around to the side a little bit and just wait their opportunity. Ashen Dawn will be going last here because I want to be able to counter charge anything he moves over to the other flank, like the Centaurs, which are quite fast, everything else in between. So that is another overview look of the battlefield. You can see what I'm prepping for on the left hand flank, playing passively, on the right hand flank, playing actively and in the center just really shooting at him and uh, waiting for him to make a move all right so 100 kingdoms win the dice roll did i mention that you get a plus one or minus one if you uh, lost the roll last time but i was getting lucky with a lot of the rolls regardless and in they go so this is 20 clash four Brutal two impact hits, uh, plus another another four impact hits at Clash five from the Priory Commander. And the uh, Praetorians at this point will be reduced to saving on ones. No resolve, of course, being Old Dominion. But we expect a lot of damage here, and we do indeed inflict a lot of damage. About three stands worth, leaving him with just a uh, command stand and one additional wounded Praetorian stand and the Archimandrite. Uh, and that puts me within striking range of wiping them out, and it makes it harder for the Archimandrite to heal them because they are broken. So uh, the Archimandrite has to rally them and then heal them, and it just uh, becomes quite an aggressive play here. Of course, my regiment is now very susceptible from being charged in the flank by the Legionnaires. That's okay. I've got a lot of stuff that can countercharge. The, um, the Cultists can shoot me. Well, they're not very good at shooting. The Kerries can insanity me. Well, my resolve is re relatively good against that. So so I'm happy with this play here and of course an even better photograph from the other side showing the brutality of the wonderful Crimson Tower Knights. On the other side my opponent um, making a bit of a play here just uh, trying to block my, my Ashen Dawn with his Legionnaires didn't really like this play I feel like he's sort of just giving them away from free and he doesn't really need the dark power. So this uh, is fine for me. I can just shoot at them and then um, Ash and Dawn are going to be the last unit to activate so they'll finish off the last few wounds if there are still any Legionnaires left alive at that point. Speaking of which, crossbows activate and they start shooting into that very combat to pick them off. Uh, we also have the counter charge here in the middle. Legionnaires into the side of the Crimson Tower Knights. But this is the supremacy turn. So the Priory Commander has given Blessed to the uh, Ashen Dawn and the Crimson Tower Knight. So in, in here, if he does manage to score a lot of hits, he's in the side, I don't get the shield. I could use Blessed here. I could just save it for the Praetorians. So no real damage taken from this charge. Maybe a couple of wounds. And then, of course, the Ashen Dawn have hardened against the Centaur Caracus. So... Um, <laughs> challenging him to a duel here for the Archimandrite. This is fairly insignificant, although with the Archimandrite having to decline the duel, it means that if he does get rid of my Crimson Tower Knights this turn, he can't seize the zone with the Praetorians if I've wiped out the Legionnaires as well. So finally seeing a little bit of a consequential duel occurring. On this side, uh, we have the Karakas firing their, their bows, their undead bows, and doing nothing against the um, Ashen Dawn, as you'd expect. Over here, we have the Archimandrite rallying his unit of, of boys and nuking my guys with a spell or whatever he did. Um, I can't quite remember what the, the, the uh, sequence of events of this turn was, but love the photo. Then we have the Steel Legion charging the, uh, the Legionnaires from the flank and absolutely murdering them as you'd expect them to, given that they are Steel Legion after all. Big, powerful uh, unit, which are now mainstays, but still they hit just as hard. Slightly better resolution photo or better focus up the front foreground. Then uh, with a little bit of uh, space having been created, we can move forward with the mage. And what's going on here is that I'm getting the opportunity to 
take this area of the mage, like if that's the front of, of her base, we can trace a line between that and the corner of the legionnaire base here. I might need to use a slightly different color to make that a bit more visible, but that's what's going on. She's drawing line of sight from her base legionnaires to shoot her fire dart spell and uh, possibly even getting a few shots with the crossbows as well. Would have liked to shoot the Praetorians, but they are defense five now, and their hill is in the way as well as the Crimson Tower, so I couldn't really ac accomplish that. But getting rid of the Legionnaires is the next step. So that's what she's attempting to do, as you can sort of see through that little angle, just going corner to corner or in your front of base to the corner there, um, this little spot here to pick off some Legionnaires. Then uh, we have the Hunter Cadre, who are, who are on a hill, so they're size 2, and they can also shoot into the close combat as well. And by triple teaming everybody, we can actually shoot that last stand of Legionnaires there. So they've been hit by the Steel Legion and by the Mage over here and the Hunter Cadre, and that's how we finish off the Legionnaires, which is a feel-good moment. We have the... Uh, ugh, Cultists, they are in range to throw a few bombs at the Crimson Tower Knights, which somehow manages to do some work, actually doing some wounds to them, which is quite kind of annoying. Then we have uh, the Men at Arms moving around a little bit, uh, and also the Hunter Cadre from this side, just trying to get a bit of an angle to the carries off in the distance. Um, I did consider this play here with the Men at Arms double marching to get the charge next. Uh, the thinking here is that the carries are going to want to go against the Crimson Tower Knights. If they go against the Men-at-Arms this turn, it means that I have, you know, the, the Crimson Tower Knights are going to be in play. But if they uh, if they go against the Crimson Tower Knights, I could charge them with the Men-at-Arms the next turn. So just trying to put some pressure on. And this is a great way to play Conquest where you actually create more than one threat for your opponent rather than just feeding things in one regiment at a time. You have that sort of supporting uh, effect with your, your strategy overall. On the left here, we're continuing to move up with the Steel Legion on this side, just really wanting to get into a position where he, he, um, he double marches or march charges with the Centaurs. Um, so that I have the chance to maybe win the role and 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 beat him up in close combat. I feel like the Prodromoi won't be able to completely wipe me out, so I should be able to hold them down with this regiment for a little bit longer, if not completely uh, win the fight against them if I get the jump on them. Bucephaloi now um, creating this traffic jam where, unfortunately, the, the horse archers can't really shoot through them. I feel like Sure Shot should let you shoot through your own units, but it doesn't do that. So the Bucephaloi have to move through them onto the zone, otherwise he can't score from this zone. Great looking miniatures though. Ash and Dawn have completely removed the Legion as at this point, so it's now going to be a standoff between the, the big bull cows that are undead and the Ash and Dawn, which have still taken no damage whatsoever. And they've also moved sideways a little bit to make room for the uh, Hunter Cadre, which do have Fiend Hunter, and that will mean that they are a little bit more effective against those Bucephaloids, so that'll put a bit of a timer on my opponent trying to do something with them, hopefully just running straight into the jaws of the Ash and Dawn. Uh, and that's hopefully the way we can overcome them on this flank. Righty, so first regiment is going to be the Priory Commander to uh, challenge the Archimandrite to a duel and then the Crimson Tower Knights to hopefully finish them off. But my opponent wins the roll finally. And uh, also you can see in the background he's brought in his Varangia cards in that last turn as well. But he wins the roll. He um, is using his Supremacy to get the Absolute Blasting Effect spell onto me and uh, wiping out the last of my Crimson Tower Knights, unfortunately. The Priory Commander does get his free attack attack but doesn't do enough damage because again the Archimandrite has healed his own unit and then nuked my unit so that didn't quite work that allows him to charge the Steel Legion over here uh, which brings the fight to me a little bit and creates a bit of space for his Varangian guards to camp that zone so over here that does give me the opportunity to attack his carries because my first cards were going to be the knights they uh, were deleted before they could activate i go straight down the stack into the men at arms which can charge the carries do a stand worth of damage that's brilliant because the archimandrite is now out of range to to heal them and these little humble plebs here will uh tie down the center of the table for a while just slowing down this particular position so that the rest of my shooting contingents all of my crossbows and hunter cadre can just mow down the last of those Praetorians and then deal with the Varangian guards from long range, which is the safe, safest way to deal with Varangian guards, to be sure. Over here, the Hunter Cadre 
unleashing a devastating volley into the Bucephaloi, who have Tenacious now, but I have Fiend Hunter, so stripping them of a number of wounds already. On this side, he's trying to see if he can get the horse archers uh, shooting into combat against the men at arms, because the Bucephaloi are blocking his line of sight through to the to the uh, Ashen Dawn. So just trying to plink off a few shots into the the men on the left. On the right hand side, the hunter cadre moving in to shoot at the Praetorian guards at effective range, close range, uh, without shields, doing some more work onto them from that spot. Um, over here, we have the cultists barraging the men-at-arms, doing some work onto them, leaving me with just one stand left, but still, he has slowed down. Uh, in fact, I think what happened here is the carries were having a go at them, and then the cultists had a go at them, so eventually wiping them out. But on this side, we have the crossbows moving up to continue shooting at the Archimandrites unit. Every volley is just doing work here, and we're eventually able to take them out once the Steel Legion activate and uh, chop down the last remaining stand there. Um, he is defense five, but I do go down to, sorry, I think he's defense four in this case because he had to charge me in this particular turn. So chopping him down to defense two to finish him off. My opponent, um, just trying to make something happen here, he's decided to march charge the Steel Legion. I feel like this is just a little bit of the game winding down now. It's just like you you probably don't want to do this, but he he wanted to be able to attack the Ashendorn with the Bucephaloi without these guys going in the flank, so he decided to, to tie me up here. But the Steel Legion haven't activated yet, which is sad. So now that they do activate, they have a full 13, what is it, 16 attacks at Clash 4 or Cleave 2 to absolutely chop the legs off the um, the Prodromoy, sadly. All right, over here, the Varangia Guard um, are screened off by my last remaining um, Steel Legion, who have literally just one wound left in the regiment. But I have two crossbows, the Mage with Fire Dark, Kiss Farewell, and a Hunter Cadre Regiment, and they're all starting to bombard the, the Varangia Guards there, so that's not going to last long. On the side, um, I have gone in here um, against the Bucephaloi. There's just, um, well, there's three stands, but one of them's taken four wounds. And this is the point in the game where we pretty much called it because uh, the Varangian guards aren't going to last very long against um, three shooting units and a mage. And then I have the Hunter Cadre to score on that side of the table. And on this side of the table, he's just lost his Centaur, Centaur Prodromoy. He's up against Ashen Dawn with Bucephaloi. And the Ashen Dawn is sort of favored here. Plus, I've got units behind them to keep shooting. And nothing's really moving very fast in the center. So that was it. It was a convincing win to 100 Kingdoms. But I don't feel like this is particularly indicative of the matchup. My opponent um, was trying out a few new things, which uh, I don't think really represented the best synergies that 100 Kingdoms can really pull off. The dice did go my way in terms of reinforce, uh, sorry, well, reinforcement rolls it did, and the su uh, supremacy rolls also uh, went well. And I think my opponent just really made a, a few positioning mistakes uh, and timing mistakes in, in terms of when to attack, like moving a unit in without any support, letting it die, running out of cards, makes it a bit easier for me to win late game. I am concerned about um, Old Dominion. I am worried about, again, facing off against the Stratagos, where it's sort of like you've got a free reform on that crucial turn. The banner that gives you plus one dark power level, I think it's going to be a, pretty much a staple in, in Old Dominion. With Bucephalo becoming a little bit better and, and Fallen Divinity becoming a little bit better, I think you'll see them on the field a bit more. But um, right now, I suspect it still is Stratagos best list and you definitely want to go lots of spellcasters archimandrite you want to go um uh hyro deacon take the moroi take the carries take cultist legionnaires legionnaires still very strong and possibly um uh, canaphors as well bone golems still nothing wrong with them i feel like bone golems are almost better now that the aura of death thing has changed because if you chop them down to like one stand left they can still maximize their aura of death capabilities so that's going to be a powerful one in future and uh, some of the stuff that was very good against old dominion like some of the uh Wadroon shenanigans like slick slingers with flint napper and triple activation that doesn't work anymore so it's going to be an interesting patch. I think the game is overall better, but we shall see. Really enjoying it so far and uh, looking forward to sending you guys some more bat reps.